Welcome everybody to the second uh, part of our Notes from the Field special on the Basic Necessity Survey. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Heidi Kretzer. I'm a conservation social scientist with the Rights and Communities Program I'm based in New York, although not New York City, but far north New York. Um, but I uh, work across a lot of the programs to help implement both social safeguards and apply social sciences. And one of the goals of our rights and communities program is to help support teams across the globe to apply social sciences and conservation practice. So um, the impetus for this series is that we know a lot of teams are um, contemplating or already using the basic necessities survey in their work. And there is a lot of teams who have um, been wrestling over the years with how to apply and how to put it together. So we thought we'd put together this uh, three-part series. And just as a note, um, we will be recording. You probably already saw that. We'll make the presentation available shortly after the talk. Um, last week, we were very fortunate to have an amazing talk from Jess Leroux, who's an assistant professor of geography at Middlebury College. And she gave an overview of the basic necessities survey and pointed out some really interesting findings from the DRC, notably de demonstrating how uh, BNS is very sensitive to pick up on in impacts from exogenous uh, social, political, and economic factors. So ble please do take the time to watch that presentation if you were unable to join us last week. I believe you can find the link in the invitation that Todd sent out uh, for this week's talk. And then next week, um, our final presentation will be on June 14th, on Tuesday, same time, 9 a.m. East Coast uh, time and uh, on the same Zoom link. And we will feature Jennifer O'Leary of the Western Indian Ocean Marine Program, where the teams have been applying the basic necessities survey across different political contexts in Kenya and Tanzania. And they have also been experimenting um, with modifying the approach. So this week, we are very happy to have Henry Travers giving a talk on the application of BNS over a decade in Cambodia and some of the challenges that have been presented as the conservation initiative ages and has impacts. Um, Henry has worked with the WCS Cambodia program in various guises since 2008, and he holds a senior research associate position at the Interdisciplinary Center for Conservation Science at the University of Oxford. He completed his PhD in conservation science from Imperial College in 2014, which focused on the design of incentives to discourage illegal forest clearance in Cambodia. Following that, he completed a three-year postdoc at the University of Oxford, working with the WCS Uganda program to deliver park action plans to combat wildlife crime. He now runs a conservation consultancy specializing in the design implementation and evaluation of community-focused interventions, and he lives in Rome. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Henry. And once again, thank you all for coming today. Go ahead, Henry. Great, thanks, Heidi. I'm just gonna try and share my screen. I hope this works. Okay, so can you see the uh, slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Brilliant. Um, great, so as Heidi said, my name's Henry. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about some of the challenges we face running long-term impact monitoring in Cambodia using the Basic Necessity Survey. So Cambodia was one of WCS's original test beds for the BNS. And as a result, we've probably been first to experience some of the issues associated with its long term use. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on some of the challenges that we have faced and then present some kind of tentative solutions to those challenges. So WC Cambodia actually has um, more than one long running social impact assessment um, in different landscapes, but I'm going to focus on the results of one from here in the Northern Plains landscape. Um, so this is a network of protected areas in the north of the country, kind of nestled in between Thailand and the Lao borders. It's largely a forested landscape, um, so it has open dry ditch carp forest, 
has um, several globally important populations of endangered birds, notably the critically endangered um, giant ibis. It's also home to a number of local communities who live in villages bordering the protected areas, but also inside the protected areas, particularly in Kulin Promptep Wildlife Sanctuary. So just to give you a very brief potted history of the landscape. So Kulin Promptep was first gazetted in 1993, but was largely a paper park. Um, then there were early biodiversity surveys in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, Chet Wildlife Sanctuary, or Prevahir Protected Forest, as it was known at the time, was gazetted in 2002. And active management with support from WCS kind of really started in about 2005. And then for the following few years, we, there were three um, payment for ecosystem services programs that were kind of initiated. So a bird nest protection scheme in 2005, ecotourism in 2008, and then the Ibis Rice program was started in 2009. Following that, there've been kind of various phases of expansion of these programs. Notably in 2015, five new villages were added to the Ibis Rice program. And that kind of expansion has carried on to the present day. So just to focus in on Ibis Rice specifically, so this is a conservation enterprise program that was launched by WCS in 2009. This kind of mission statement is to allow people, wildlife and nature to coexist and thrive. So it does that by supporting farmers to produce organic jasmine rice, um, and then participant farmers sign conservation agreements to kind of comply with the protected area rules. In return, they receive up to 60% sort of premiums on the sale of their rice, which is then kind of marketed internationally. So it's primarily a program to benefit both wildlife and the people who participate in the program. So in terms of that first objective, in terms of benefiting wildlife, we ran a randomized control trial in 2018 to try to understand the, the likelihood of people um, clearing forests, whether or not they were participated. So we randomly allocated um, people who wanted to join the program either to the treatment group where they could instantly participate or to a control group where they had to wait to participate. What we found was that the people who in the control group were four times more likely to clear forests than the people who were actually participated in Ibis Rice. So it very much looks like the conservation objective side of things is being met, at least in terms of those people who are actually participating. But that leaves the question of what about the people? So to answer this question, WCS has been running a kind of long-term evaluation from 2008 to assess the well-being impacts of the Northern Plains program. So that has kind of two main objectives, um, looking at has conservation management of the landscape as a whole had an impact on the people who live there? And then has the Ibis Rice program specifically benefited the people who participate in that program? So before I kind of want to get, get into the kind of nitty gritty, I'd like to sort of take a step back and think about why we do these evaluations anyway. And you know, there are lots of reasons why you might want to assess your impact um, from reporting to donors or, for instance, in the case of Ibis Rice, it's kind of sold on this lovely story of a product that's kind of in harmony with nature, benefiting both wildlife and people. And it's important to be able to evidence those claims to make sure that we're actually having the impact that we say we're having. But I'd just like to touch on a point that kind of Jess raised in the talk last week, which is this idea of doing no harm. And I think this is, I think when we talk about the principle of doing no harm, often what we think about is trying to avoid the negative impacts from imposed interventions. So interventions which people don't really have a choice about whether or not they experience. So things like law enforcement or resource access to restrictions and so on. But I think doing no harm also applies to voluntary programs. So a lot of the people that we work with are resource and time poor who can often not afford to participate in programs that kind of fail to produce the expected benefits. So it's kind of incumbent on us as intervention proponents to make sure that we, under, we know whether or not these interventions that we're implementing actually have the impacts that we expect them to. And we can kind of do that in two different ways, but I think it's really important to 
build the experimental design into program development. So in other words, when you're first thinking about how setting up these programs, you're also thinking about how you're going to assess the impact of those programs. And if you do that, you can do some really kind of interesting things with randomized control trials, or if you're looking at the ongoing impacts, you can do A-B tests. And then, but that kind of gives you kind of very quick understanding of particular impacts. The real value of long-term evaluations, like the ones talking about today, they can give you this kind of confidence that your interventions continue to provide ongoing impacts that you expect them to. So in the Northern Plains, our um, impact assessment is kind of structured around this regular large scale household survey. So the first household survey was done in 2008 as part of Tom Clements' um, PhD. So he did surveys in 2008, 2011. Emily Beauchamp did, uh, for her PhD, did the 2014 survey. And then from 2017 onwards, I've kind of been leading on the implementation and analysis of the, the survey. So it's structured by, like we run this household survey in um, both in villages inside the two main protected areas, also in control villages that are located outside of the protected areas that were selected to be um, similar to the treatment villages. So in other words, they were matched to have the same kind of characteristics. So proportion of forest, village size, distance to major roads, and so on. And over the years, the, the kind of the size of the survey has increased. So we had about 2,000, two, sorry, 700 households in 2008, and that's now grown to about 1,250 households in 2021. But the real core of the, the survey is a panel of households who've been interviewed every single, with every single survey wave. So that was about 700 in 2008, slowly that number's declined slightly so the last survey round we had about 700 i mean 500 households so this is just to give you an idea of where those villages are located so it's 15 villages that are shown in red um, that are either inside or immediately outside of the boundaries of the protected area and then five control villages that are located um, at least 20 kilometers away from the boundaries of those protected areas, but within the same province. Now, the experimental or the kind of analytical framework that we use to understand our impact is something called a difference in difference design. So essentially for this, we estimate the impact of um, the intervention, so living inside the protected area or participating in Ibis Rice, by comparing the, the difference between households in the control group and the treatment group at the beginning of a time period with the difference between the treatment and control group at the end of the time period. So the difference in those differences gives us the treatment effect. And I'm kind of highlighting that because what it means is it we have to use the same measurement system at the beginning and each end of each time period to make sure that we're kind of comparing like with like, because if we were measuring, for instance, the basic necessity in different ways at the, in sort of those two survey waves, we wouldn't be able to tell what was the treatment effect and what was the difference caused by having a slightly different measurement system. So why do we use the basic necessity survey for this? So we have a number of different indicators for well-being, but the BNS provides our major indicator for household material well-being. And we include it because it's less susceptible to kind of seasonal or annual vari variation, like something like income might be. Um, it's much easier to measure than these more intensive indicators income and consumption, where either you're limited by a very short recall period, or you have to measure a lot more often. And those two kind of characteristics means it's, it's a really nice indicator for measuring long term trends. It's relatively stable. And it responds, like we saw in Jesse's talk, it's quite sensitive to changes. Um, but it also is easy to measure. So Northern Plains, um, we have a list of about 35 items. So it was 35 when it was originally 
The list was originally developed in 2008. We've since added some. And we apply a 50% threshold on the weights. So that's pretty standard. What it means is that items that fewer than 50% of people think are basic necessities don't end up contributing to the household score. And then we make sure that we hold weights constant over individual time periods. So how people perceive different basic different items on the list might change over time, but we make sure that the, the weightings that are come from that proportion of people who think different items based necessities is held constant again so that we make sure that we're comparing like with like when we do the impact evaluation. So back in 2008 when the list of items was originally developed, um, Tom made sure that sort of the items fell within five different categories. So this table is um, taken directly from WCS's guide to implementing BNS surveys, which is an excellent resource. So if you're thinking about doing basic necessities and you're not familiar with the guide, I do recommend you go and check it out. I just want to go through these different criteria one by one. So there's different categories. So the first category one is items that everyone thinks are basic necessities and everybody has access to or has. Category two is items which everybody thinks are basic necessities, around 50% of them have, but there's this expectation that more and more people in the future, as people get become better off, will have or have access to these items. Category three is items that everybody thinks are basic necessities, but only a few people have. But again, there's this expectation that more and more people will get these items over time as they become better off. Category four is items which some people think are basic necessities, but there's this expectation that more people will think it's a basic necessity in the future. So these might be items which people in wealthy towns, for instance, already think are basic necessities. And then finally, there's category five, which is items which pretty much no one thinks are basic necessities unless they live in the big city. And if we populate can kind of construct our list well and have enough items on the list, then essentially what you expect to see is a kind of a nice, even normal distribution across your survey population for BNS score. And that analytically, this is really helpful because it, it makes the analysis of change really a lot more straightforward than it would be otherwise. But actually in reality, it's only two of these categories which affect the distribution of score. So categories four and five, for both of those categories, items in those categories, we expect that fewer than 50% of people who we ask will think of those items as being basic necessities, which means their weights are less than 0.5, which means they don't contribute to the household score. And then items in category one, they're items which everybody has. So all they really do is change the base score. So in other words, they don't influence the distribution of score, they just change the mean and change sort of where it appears on the score, on this graph. So that kind of leaves us in a situation where we've only got two of these categories, which are kind of doing the heavy lifting and allowing us to make comparisons between households or between time periods. So you might ask at this point, well, why have we got five categories then when only two of them are really useful? So each of these categories performs a role. So categories one and five are really useful when you're doing the evaluation itself. So when you're running the survey. So it's helpful for enumerators to have items which everyone thinks are basic necessities and items which nobody thinks are basic necessities. So that when you're kind of asking these questions, um, the enumerators can tell whether or not someone has understood the concept of what we mean by a basic necessity. So if someone, for instance, says an item is item in category five, they think is a basic necessity or an item in category one isn't a basic necessity, um, it, chances are they may not have fully understand what we meant by the basic necessity. So we include these items right at the beginning of the list and then it helps the enumerators 
see whether or not they can continue with the rest of the list. We also include items in category one to make sure that there are at least some items on the list that everybody has. So you kind of avoid the situation where you're sort of getting someone to say whether or not they have, have a long list of items and they say no to everyone. And then category number four, we include to try and sort of future proof the list. So although these items may not be considered to be basic necessities now, there is this expectation that they'll be considered to be basic necessities in the future. So we include them to sort of say, right, well, in the future, we expect items in category four to feed into kind of categories three and two. And how that list, each list is composed within these different five different categories then affects the kind of the distribution that you would expect to see. So if you can imagine a situation where you have the same group of people whose well-being is measured using two different lists. So say list one, you might have more items in category two, and list two, you might have more items in category three. Those different lists are going to produce different distributions of score. So they might have a different shape, and they might have different means. What that means is that as the change, if you use those lists to measure change in score over time, that it becomes very difficult to know, is the change that we measure with list one equivalent to the change that we measured during the list two? And so this kind of highlights the point of um, the reason why it's really important to have, or at least traditionally it has been, to have the same list to measure changes over time. Because if you have different lists, they will, be, they will behave in different ways. And so you can't be sure whether or not the change that you're measuring is equivalent to the change that you measured using a different list. So that's very much the kind of the theoretical side of things. Um, so what kind of issues does this throw up for us in Cambodia? Well, Cambodia is a country that is going through very rapid economic change. So this graph shows the national GDP for Cambodia since 1950. This is the period where we're, we've been running the, um, the impact assessment in the Northern Plains from 2008 onwards. And you can see it's a period of very, very rapid economic growth. And much of that is located sort of outside of the cities in rural areas as well. So that kind of throws up two main problems for us. So the first is that how people perceive the, the, the items on our list has changed over time. And the second is that the proportion of people who have different items has also changed over time. In some cases, quite, quite significantly. So if we focus initially on how these items have been perceived and how that has changed over time. Remember I said that it's important to try and hold, ideally for an impact assessment, we would hold weights constantly. So what you really want for your list is items where sort of about the same proportion, each survey wave say that they think it's a basic necessity. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the items on our list and show how they kind of don't conform to what that kind of ideal behavior that we would want. So this first item is, um, whether or not a household has at least two draft animals. So back in 2008, most people were transporting their crops and getting around using ox carts. And gradually over time, those ox carts have become redundant, uh, been made redundant through motorized forms of transport. So they might have motorized hand, motorized hand tra tractors or motorbikes or cars or trucks or and so what this has meant is the kind of the proportion of people who think that having draft animals is a basic necessity has dropped significantly from near 100% in 2008 to under 20% for the last survey. And that, it kind of goes against one of the, I guess, one of the sort of unspoken assumptions for items on your list, which is that items on the list become more important over time. So once something is a basic necessity, it doesn't drop out 
people don't sort of end up thinking it's no longer a basic necessity. Um, but as we can see that something like draft animals here, it no, people don't no longer think it was it's a basic necessity. So while it was contributing to the household score in 2008, it no longer contributes to household score. Um, and that produces a problem for us because we can't, um, we can't now include it in the 2008 changes because we, if we did include it, we wouldn't be measuring like with like now with assessing change and it's not contributing to household score. So the second item I wanna highlight is something, in this case, it's um, having electricity access within your home. And this is what I kind of think of as a classic category four item. So start off with fewer than 50% of people thinking it's a basic necessity, relatively consistent over time until you get to 2014, when you see this big increase in the proportion of people who think it's a basic necessity. Um, and so this is a sort of exactly the type of behavior that you would expect to see from a category four item. But even these kind of items introduce some problems for us because back in 2008, it wasn't being considered to be a basic necessity. So it wasn't contributing to household score, but now it does contribute to household score. So if we're considering change over the entire period of the evaluation, we can't really include this item because then we'd be having different lists. And then finally, I wanna pick out televisions, which um, were kind of included as a category four item in the list. So, um, doesn't perform quite as well. Um, so you can see from sort of 2008 to 2014, some people thought it was basic necessity, but not everybody thought it was basic necessity. And then from 2014 to 2017, it does what you kind of, what would you expect from a category four item? You see this big increase in the proportion of people who think it's a basic necessity. But then from 2017, actually, the proportion of people who thought it's basic necessity dropped significantly. And when we tried to find out why that was, the explanation that we got back was that people kind of felt that it had been made redundant by having access to smartphones and tablets and cheap data. And so although this item was included as a way of kind of future proofing the list, it's actually, it hasn't performed as we would have expected, which kind of highlights the difficulty in predicting which items are gonna become basic necessities in the future and when they're gonna become basic necessities. So that was kind of how people perceive the different items on the list. But what we've also seen change over time is the proportion of people who have those different items. So this distribution shows um, this graph shows the distribution in well-being index. So that's that total household score divided by the, the maximum possible score on the list. And this was measured in 2008. And you can see it's sort of this nice, normal, effectively normal distribution, which conforms to our expectation of what we would see. Then this curve shows the distribution that we get um, in 2021. And you can see that there's been a significant shift to the right in the mean. So on average, people are much better off than they were back in 2008. Now that's not a problem in itself, that's a good thing. The problem for us is that um, here in the bottom right corner, the distribution is now encroaching one, which means that there are some people in our sample who effectively have every item on the list which contributes to household score. And that means that if we continue to use this same list over time, you will have more and more people who we can't assess the change, their change in well-being. So you'll get this kind of second peak around one, um, and that will inhibit our ability to be able to assess the impact. So change over time, assess the impact of the programs, particularly for kind of subpopulations of better off households. So if you add those two kind of issues together, so the proportion, how people perceive the items on the list and the proportion of people who have those items, then you get a change in the composition of the list. So the number of items that fall into those five different categories. 
And so you can see that in this graph here. So from 2008, we had about 19 items that were either in category two or category three. So the, remember, those are the kind of the items that allow us to make comparisons between households or over time. But by 2020 or 2021, as it actually was, we said no items in category three and only eight items in category two. So that means we've kind of lost utility in the list. So it's much harder now for us to make comparisons between households or to continue to use this list to make comparisons in the future, changing over time. We can also see that in 2008, there were about, well, there were six items that were sort of fall into the category four. Um, and these are the items that we would then expect to feed into categories two and three over time. And what we actually see is that the number of items in category four pretty much remains constant across the five different survey waves. So we're not getting this feed in effect that we would see. So despite the fact that these items were included to kind of future proof the list, that hasn't really happened. So those are the kind of the issues that we see. And I would love to kind of sit here and say, well, I have all the answers, but um, I don't. So I have some answers that I kind of, I think I have a sort of tentative solution, but this is very much untested. So um, the sort of, yeah, the recommendations that I'm gonna present at the end, I think need further testing in order to be able to be confidently say this, this, this approach fixes the problem. Um, but essentially in my mind, the only way to overcome this, these issues of declining utility or the fact that some, some of our sample now have pretty much all of the scoring items on the list is to add in new items. The problem is that when you add in new items, you're no longer comparing apples with apples. So the changes that you see um, in different time periods may represent different things. So in order to use those changes as the basis of our impact assessment, we first need to find a way to make comparisons between changes measured during different lists. Um, my screen, okay. Um, so this is um, this graph shows the um, the change in BNS score measured for our panel sample between 2008 and 2011. So this is the absolute change in household score. So the purple line shows the distribution, the change in score as measured by the full list of 35 items. And then what I've done is to create two sublists from our full list of items, which is shown by the red and the blue lines. So to create these sublists, I've just randomly allocated items from the full list of 35 items to one of these two lists. Um, so no item in category in the in the red um, list is the same as in the blue list, but all of the items in the red and blue list are inside the purple list. Um, so essentially we've got three different lists which are measuring the same change for the same population over the same time period. And you can see that they're all different. Um, so they all give us different results. So the shape of the distribution is different and the means are different. Um, and that's a problem because it means that these different lists are telling us different things. So if we want to be able to make comparisons between these lists, they need to have the same mean and they need to have the same shape. So one of the things that we can do to produce the same kind of shape is to try to standardize the change in score that we see. So a common way of trying to do this is to use um, WBI. So that's when you take the score and you divide it by the maximum possible score for um, each, each list. So you can see when you do this and 
So you plot them out using WBI rather than absolute change in score. So the, the red list now becomes very similar in shape to the purple list, but the blue list is still showing a very different shape of distribution um, than the purple list and the red list, and they all have different means. So while WBI is an improvement, it's not enough. But if some of you can remember back to sort of secondary school statistics, what you want to do, if you want to kind of create a standard um, normal distribution, then the best way to do it is to divide, divide through by the standard deviation. So essentially, you've got a distribution with a standard deviation of one. And when we do that, we end up with each of these lists having approximately the same shape, um, which is what we're after. Just to kind of convince you of that, if I give them all a mean of zero, you can see that they're all about the same shape. So we can standardize the change in score and provide the same shape of distribution by dividing through by the standard deviation. The problem with that is that they still have different means. So we're still seeing measuring a different change over time for these three different lists. And while we can manipulate the kind of the, the well, we can manipulate the shape and we can standardize by using standard deviation. We can't manipulate the means because if we do that, say for instance, we make them all zero, then we're losing information. So if we were using different lists for different time periods, we wouldn't be able to see whether or not there was a bigger change in one time period than in another. So we need to have some other way of trying to get the same size of change using different lists. So what I've done here is the same kind of exercise. So produce two sublists from the main list of 35 items. But rather than just randomly allocating items to these two lists, I've produced two lists which have the same composition of items. So the same number of items in each of those five different categories, or in particular, the three different categories that contribute to the mean and the shape of the distribution. So categories one, two, and three. And um, what you can see is that the, the, the two sublists are now behaving almost exactly the same. So they have the same shape of distribution and they have the same mean. Um, but they still have different means and different distributions to the score, the change in score that's being measured by the the full list. And that's largely because they have different number of items on those lists. So now when we standardize by dividing through by the standard deviation, what we see is that we effectively have three, three different lists behaving in exactly the same way. So they have the same shape of distribution and they have exactly the same mean. Um, and that should mean that we can now use different lists to measure the same change over time. And for those of you who really like using WBI, actually when you have, when you match your lists for, to try to match the composition, WBI performs almost as well as standardizing as dividing through by the standard deviation. So that's the kind of the approach that I think will solve the problem. Um, so these are kind of my untested recommendations for how to use the basic necessity survey for long-term impact monitoring. So the first is to get your list right in the first place. So prioritize items in categories two and three when developing your original list, um, because those are the ones that allow you to make comparisons between households and over time. I wouldn't worry about identifying items for category four at all. I don't think they're useful. Um, as we saw, like the items in the category four that we included in the Northern Plains, they never really, really fed into um, categories two and three. So they didn't really perform their role. So rather than trying to think, get the list right in the first place, I would just, every time that you do a survey, so every time that you're measuring, using the BNS to measure well-being, you, re you can, before you do that, you can review what how people think what people think the composition of your list is so you can get people 
to review the list and see which item, which categories they think I, each item falls into. And then before you do the survey, you can adjust the list by maybe adding in items or dropping out items to ensure that your new, the list that you use for the next time period has the same composition as the list that you use for the previous time period. So it has the same number of items in the different categories. And then when you come to do the analysis, you standardize the change in score by dividing by the standard deviation to give you the same shape of distributions. And I think if you do all of those things, that gives you two potential applications. So the first is being able to do these long-term impact monitoring um, programs that I've been talking about. And that should be something that's relatively easy to test. So if we want to test whether or not this approach works, we can just get a single population and track their changes over time using two completely independent lists. And it should be that if you follow that approach, those you can make comparisons between those lists, despite the fact that they have completely different items on them. The second potential application I think that we can use this for is comparing changes between landscapes. So I don't know, imagine if you've got a regional program where you're implementing interventions across different landscapes or in different countries. And because the BNS lists are produced kind of in a participatory way, then you would expect them to be different. So that means traditionally, we haven't been able to make comparisons between different landscapes or between countries. But I think if you follow this approach and end up with a standardized change, then you should now start to be able to make these inter-landscape comparisons. Um, it's much harder to change, to test whether or not that works. Um, but I think there are ways that we could test that. So what happens when we do all of this in the Northern Plains? Um, so once we've sort of done all of that um, and we're trying to understand the impact on for Ibis rice, what we found was that participation in the Ibis rice program improved household well-being as measured by the basic necessity survey by an additional 60% compared to matched control households. So even though we're in this period of rapid economic growth, um, farmers that participated in Ibis rice became better off much faster than similar households in the same villages. Great, so thank you very much for bearing with that. I know it's quite technical. Um, we have some time left for discussion, but if you have any questions that we don't get to in the discussion, please feel free to email me. Um, and then just before I finish, I'd like to thank both Heidi and Todd for all their work putting together this short series of talks. Thanks. This was, this was great. Thank you, Henry. That was really terrific.